and welcome back to the series. Alright, so we've got quite a lot working with our visual novels now. As you can see, we have backgrounds, music, characters working, all this good stuff, so it's looking pretty good for the most part. Now, one thing that we're missing right now that we're going to fix in this episode is some kind of user prompt that shows us when to click to the next piece of dialogue. As you can see, the text just builds and then it stops. So, you wouldn't know if the game is frozen right now, um, but we go ahead and click and we're able to progress forward. But I want to get us some kind of prompt that's going to allow us to see visually when we click to when we want to click to the next line. Be that a button that says next or some kind of little symbol that bounces at the end of the line. I'm going to go with a little symbol that is brought to the very end of the text and kind of just bounces up and down, signaling to us that we have finished the line and it's now clear to proceed to the next one. So we're only going to need one little script for that. So let's go ahead and get started. This script is going to be in our dialog folder, and it's just going to be a C-sharp script called Dialog Continue Prompt. This class is going to be responsible for displaying an object on the scene at the end of our text to show us that we are clear to proceed to the next line. This class is going to be contained within the dialog namespace, so I can isolate it from other parts of the, the project. And we only need a couple little variables here for us. So we're going to want to take an object in the scene. This will be on the UI, but it's going to be an object that we want to position at the very end of the text. So we're going to need a reference to rect transform. We can make this a private and just specify a rect transform and call this the root of the object. The other two things that we're going to need is a reference to the text, so that way we know where the last character is, and that'll just come from the dialog system, and we're also going to want some kind of animator that will be attached to this object. That way it can bounce up and down and we have something to activate and deactivate. So we're just going to make these two private variables, but serialize them so that way we can assign them from the inspector. One for the animator, and one for the text mesh pro object. Now, inside of start, we need to go ahead and get the rect transform of this object. No need to assign that in the inspector, because we can just grab it from itself. Root is just going to equal get component transform off of the object that we're working with. And now we want two functions that are going to run in this class. The first one is going to be a public void called show. And this will begin displaying the little character or item at the end of the line. And then we also want public void hide. And this will hide it. And that will be for when we move on to the next line and we start generating text again. It should only show when the text is finished and it should always hide itself once text is being generated again. And if we're messing with visibility, it'd be best if we could determine what the current state of it is. So let's add a quick little boolean that will tell us whether it is visible or not. We'll have a public boolean, vool, maybe not, a public boolean called is showing, And this is going to be equal to true if our animator is active in the scene. Whenever we hide it, all we're going to do is disable the animator. And so when we re-enable the animator, then the items that are attached to it, including the visuals, are going to show back up on the screen. So we'll check anim.gameobject.activeSelf. So if we're trying to show this text, the first thing we need to do is make sure that our text is not empty. And we'll do that just by checking if our TM Pro text is empty. If it is, then we know we don't want to do anything. And maybe what we'll do here as well is if we are showing currently, then we'll go ahead and make sure we hide. So if is showing and there's no text to set this thing to the position to, then let's just go ahead and hide ourselves. And now we need to go ahead and position this thing at the end of the text if we've made it this far. But the first thing we need to do before we can find the end of the text is we need to make sure that our text mesh pro object has force updated its mesh. And if you remember from the text architect, we can call that by tmpro.force mesh update. And that will update all the text information. The next thing we need to do is we need to make sure the animator is active. So anim.gameObject.setActiveTrue will make sure that this object is visible in the scene. And now let's just go ahead and say root.transform.setParent. We want to set it 
to the tmpro.transform, just so this thing stays in line with its parent. And now comes the point of actually calculating the position of where this thing needs to be. So we need to get the character info for the final character in the text mesh pro string. That's going to have the information such as the positioning and the, the point size of the character to determine where in height and where in the, the horizontal uh, axis this new object should be placed. So we can find all of that with the TMP character info class. And we're just going to call this variable the final character. This is going to be equal to tmpro.textInfo. And then we're going to look inside of the character info at the last character, which would be tmpro.textInfo.characterCount minus one. That will be the final character. And now the starting position for where we want to position this thing is just going to be at the bottom right of the last character. So that will be at the very end of the string. So let's cache that position as vector three target pose. And that's going to equal the final character dot bottom right. Okay, good so far. Now we need to figure out the character width of this final character because some characters will be wider than others, such as W will be wider than an exclamation point. We want to make sure that we actually account for the size of the, the final character into this position calculation. So let's see float character width. This is going to equal the final character dot point size. And then we need to multiply it by 0 0.5 because this is we only need to calculate half of it. We only need to calculate half because if we're starting from the center of the character, then it's only going to be half the point size over to the right to find the end of it. Simple enough. And then let's calculate our final position. Our final position, we're just going to edit the target pose and say that it equals a new vector3, taking in our target pose dot x plus the character width. And then we're going to take the target pose dot y, and we don't need to worry about any depth since this is on the UI, so that z value will be 0. And now we just need to assign the position, so root dot local position equals target position. So that will show it and set it to the end of the text. And if we hide it, very simply, all we need to do is active false, And this is ready to roll. So I have a little graphic arrow here. This is what's going to show up at the end of the text and just bounce up and down. So I'm going to take this into the main graphics UI and I'll just drag that in here. This will also be available for download. We'll turn that into a sprite so that way we can assign it to the image component that we'll be adding and just apply. So we have one sprite for this arrow. And now let's go into our layers inside of the main render group and find our dialog panel. Our dialog panel has the root container which has our dialog on it. And so inside of the root container I'm just going to create a new empty and this will be the dialog prompt. And we'll go ahead and add the dialog continue prompt to that object. And in this object, let's also create an image. So that image is going to be scaled up to the size of the empty. And we're just going to apply the arrow. If I can get that back, we're going to apply the arrow to the sprite there. So there we go. We now have the arrow in our scene. Let's jump into scene view and let's kind of position this where we want this thing to be, just to get a general idea of how this is going to look. So let's scale it down to a size that might be appropriate. It's going to be really small and jump back into game view. Okay, so that looks pretty good. It doesn't have to be super visible, but we're going to see it there. And especially when it's bouncing, we're going to know that that's there for us telling us, hey, the line is finished. So we've got like that. And then the image is just our arrow. So our image needs an animator on it. So let's open up the animation tab. And if it's not there, just go to window, animation, animation. And with the image selected, let's go ahead and click create. And now let's go into main for our folder, because we have a, for our hierarchy rather, because we have a folder already in here called animations. 
And inside of there, we have those basic animations for our characters. Let's make a new folder. And this folder is going to be for our UI. Inside the UI folder, let's make another folder. And this is going to be for our dialogue continue prompt. And inside of that folder, let's make a new animation called bounce. So now we have bounce. Let's toggle this record button here so that way it'll log every change we make. And then let's just quickly drag this thing, put it back in its original position so that way we have a starting keyframe and move to about 25 on the track, move it down about a quarter of the way, and then just copy the first keyframe and paste that at 50. And what we should have is a little bouncing effect. If we go into the game view, then we can see that's about what it will look like. I may scale that up later, but for now, I think that is a good size. And who knows, that might actually be fine just the way it is. But there we go. Let's go ahead and take off the record button so we don't make any mistakes, stop playing, and go back to our dialogue prompt where we can now assign the animator as our image. And the text mesh pro object that we want to check for assigning the position will just be our dialogue text from the root container. There we are. And by default, I'm actually going to rename image to arrow, and I'm going to disable it. So we've got our dialogue prompt, but now we need to link it up to our dialogue system so that way our conversation manager will know when we're waiting for user input that this dialogue prompt needs to show. So back in our dialogue scripts, let's go to the managers and let's open the conversation manager. The conversation manager is what runs our conversations, obviously, um, given by the name there and given by the fact that you all have already coded this along with me we should be familiar with how this works. So running conversation is the main function that we're using here. And once we get to the point of after we've run the commands, we are now looking for if the line has dialogue. If it does, then we need to wait for user input before we continue on to the next line. I'm just gonna add another comment and say, wait for user input if dialogue was in this line. So this is the point where we want to check for that dialogue prompt. But in order for us to do that, we need to add a reference to it. And the conversation manager is created at start by the dialogue system. So we're not going to be an initializing any values in there. Let's go ahead and initialize the dialogue prompt within our dialogue system. So up at the top, let's just go ahead and create a new variable, a, let's make public uh, dialogue, continue, if I can ever spell right, dialogue, continue prompt, and this will be a new prompt. And so in our scene, if we open the managers and go to our dialogue system controller, we now have a space for our prompt, which we can drag the dialogue prompt right into. And now we have a reference to it. So then in the conversation manager, let's go to the wait for user input function. Here, we are waiting for user prompt to be triggered true. Until that happens, we are just yielding. So before this, before we start checking, we need to make sure that that prompt is visible. So let's say dialogsystem.prompt.show. And then we wait for user input. Once user input is received, we'll say dialogsystem.prompt.hide. And this should go ahead and show it when we're at the end of the line and hide it once we move on to the next. So with all those links back in place and with our testing script set to test a dialog file, let's go ahead and play and see if this is working for us. Okay, there we are. So Stella says finally here and we have that little arrow which is bouncing up and down. And it easily tracks the end of the text. On multiple lines, you can see that it, no matter where the last character is, that arrow is going to find the proper position. I do think it might be a little small, so I am going to scale that up just a little bit. And after making a few small tweaks, I decided to make it slightly larger and also raise the height of the animation. So that way, it's just moving up and down at a higher position on the vertical axis, which we can see if we look here, instead of going below the root, I've now got it just going slightly above. 
You could also change the vertical position inside of the dialog prompt to change where it gets set at, but I just went ahead and changed the animation. So there we are. That goes ahead and places us a prompt, and now we can easily see when it's time to click. Yeah. 